we have these crossroads. And you know, either way you choose, your life is going to be different. The universe doesn't exist, but God thinks it does. We have to stop consuming our culture. We have to create culture. Stupidity has a definite evolutionary function. I am all for abolishing stupidity, but before it goes, we should pay tribute to it. Hello and oh god. <laughs> keep it. This is just how You're it's, keeping this that. This is just how it's going. Hello and welcome to the Nonsense Bazaar. We're your hosts. I'm Sequoia Kennedy. And I'm Willow Truman. And in the continuing saga of us trying to record this fucking series. <laughs> Um, this is not only the second time Your voice. Oh my God. It's, this is so bad, dude. I don't even know what to do anymore. This is so fucked. This is so fucked. Yeah. In the continuing saga of us trying to record this goddamn series. Um, this is the second time we're recording this episode and, uh, my vocal cords are absolutely shredded from allergies. I've had the worst post nasal drip a man's ever had. And this is going to be, um, something. <laughs> that goddamn right it is. This is going to be something. Because we're doing part two. This is Andrea Puharic part two, which is just Uri Geller. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the Uri and Andrea um, buddy comedy. It is. And what it really should be a buddy comedy. Mm-hmm. Played by Adam Sandler and David Spade. Which one's which? <laughs> 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 uh, and then who's Ira, I, who's Ira Einhorn? Oh, fuck. He's not in this. He has nothing to do with Uri Geller. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, David Spade is, is Puharic. Yeah, yeah. Just because, like, of the two, Adam Sandler is more of the heartthrob. Okay, wait, wait, wait. wait. In a vacuum. What about Rob Schneider? Is he involved in this? That's Ira Einhorn. Okay. <laughs> or or Kevin James could also be Ira Einhorn. I don't know. Um, yeah. He doesn't have the range like Rob he, Schneider he definitely, does. Right, right, right. No, that's true. Rob Schneider as the unicorn killer. Jesus Christ. As I put another cough drop in my mouth. Yeah. Hey, you know what, guys? Fuck it, we ball. And you guys are just going to have to listen to my hilarious voice for two fucking hours. Yep. Clicking fucking cough drops, too. We have to do this. The alien menace is trying to stop us from recording this episode. We can't fucking let them. It disappeared. My goddamn vape <sighs> corrupted two of our episode recordings. We've destroyed been my vocal lot. cords. We've been through it. Spectra has put us through <clears throat> it's in, too damn much. It's honestly insane, and we still have another episode to go. Oh, boy. The Yuri Geller episode. So, y'all have probably heard about Uri Geller, Ur- right? He is that- Uri. 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 Yeah. He is the- t- Uri, Uri. Stop it. I only have so much vocal cords left, you can't interrupt me. Yeah. <laughs> Uri Geller is a fucking superstar of a psychic. He was known the world over back in the heyday. You've probably heard about him. And, you know, even if you only know him for being the dude that, like, launched uh, St. James Randi's fucking career as a professional skeptic. Well, here's the thing. Uri Geller is weird as fuck. Everything about Uri Geller is, like, the weirdest thing in the world. It's the weirdest story I've ever heard. Probably second only to Andrea Puharic, right? <clears throat> and if you thought last week was weird, yeah, you're in for it this time. So, to recap, last week we learned about Puharic's early life, the Roundtable Foundation, Edward Arsenal, his work on CIA's project, Projects Artichoke and MK Ultra. We learned about Arigo, a brief foray into Hawaii. We talked about Eileen Garrett's wet poops. That is, we talked about some of Puharic's theories on the nervous system and psychic powers. We also learned about Puharic's medical inventions. Quote, quote, medical inventions. Right. AKA right. putting radios in people's faces. Yeah, wiring shit into their skulls and stuff. Right up to the nerve endings of the ear and the yeah. fucking tooth implanted radio and shit. Yeah. And we learned about some of the other channeling sessions he did besides just the nine, complete with bad Egyptology and what have you. Now, this episode, we are going to be pulling the focus in close to a couple of years right in the early 70s when Puhark's whole deal was studying the Israeli psychic Uri Geller. And according to his friends and family, this is kind of the period of time where he started to really go off the deep end. Yeah, Puhark did. this is. Well, that's what uh, Ira Einhorn says. Yeah. Oh, OK. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Trustworthy of narrators. Uh, it's, but it's kind of what it seems. 
Yeah, no, I I buy it. Yeah, because I so, just wish it came from someone other than Einhorn's mouth. I mean, it comes from other people too. Yeah, um, he's losing it because this whole saga and the source book we're using is documented in the book Uri, uh, a journal of the mystery of Uri Geller, a book that Buharik wrote about this multi-year period. Um, and we're using that as the source book, even though like as far as like objective truth goes. It's probably just not that. However, it is very interesting that a man who was known for trying to normalize parapsychology and shit ended up writing this book and telling this story and being like, here you go, world. Right. Why don't you take this seriously, too? uh, The world does not take Uri Geller seriously at all, really. I mean, maybe they did for a portion of time in the 70s. They did. But nowadays, his reputation is just as like a ha ha that guy. Right. Right. I mean, despite that, like, SRI took him seriously. Oh, yeah. Stanford Research Institute, a lot of the experiments, which we unfortunately won't have time to get into here. We talked about some of them back in our Psychic Spy series, but, like, some of that shit got really weird. It's a lot of really weird documented um, evidence of, of Uri Geller doing some weird fucking shit. I, I believe in the Geller. I pers- I believe in the Geller. I do not. You don't believe in any of the Geller? I mean, I think that every human has latent psychic abilities, so I do believe that he does. Yeah. But I also believe that he was a con artist and trickster as well. He was a spook? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, he was definitely a spook. Yep. But I don't know. There's some like, have you ever seen the SRI footage? No. It's wild, dude. Mm -hmm. It's wild. I mean, he put off in Targ, like have sealed black envelopes of drawings that people did. He just reproduces them without looking at them. It's oh, yeah. crazy. Like, he's very good. He's a very good psychic. I think that some of his psychic powers are real. I think that some of them are a put on and an act. Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about the spoon bending. The spoon bending and likely other stuff. I don't trust that he was totally authentic his whole life. I don't know. I like him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a fan. Uh, he, definitely, he definitely does some tricks, too. But that's neither here nor there. Also, this is the hardest episode I've ever written. Um, and there's another one after this. And the technical difficulties and the fact that my voice has left the building has only made it harder. Uh, but here's the thing. This book is only like 140 pages long, but every single goddamn sentence is a head scratcher. Like, what the fuck did I just read? It's very dense. And also, it's all probably complete fucking bullshit. But maybe not. Who knows? I don't know. The important thing is that it exists. This is Andrea Buharik's account of his adventures with with Uri Geller between the years of 1970 and 1973. So Jesus fuck, let's get into it. Before we do, we're going to consult the tarot, pull a card, talk about at the end of the episode. Please, God, set me straight. And the other thing is, like, we we wouldn't have to record today. If uh, the file got corrupted, we could save yep. my voice. True. Nope. We, it's literally, we have to do this. If you want to take pity on us, <laughs> you can join our Patreon. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I can't do a hard sell with my voice like this. I could. Do a hard sell. Yeah. You know, we go through a... A goddamn lot putting on this show for you folks. Why don't you show a little gratitude for your parents, huh? Why don't you ever call us? Why don't you ever subscribe to our Patreon? Why don't you wear a jacket when it's cold out? Why don't you listen to me? (laughs) Uh, No, but really, I'm being ridiculous. We do have a Patreon. And these last two weeks with this Puharic bullshit, it's put us behind. We've, We've been in a bind. And we do greatly appreciate the support because it's what helps keep us going and it helps keep us ad free. It does. And I'm here's the thing. I don't work a full work week because I need to make the show. Why do I need to make the show? If you haven't figured it out yet, your boy's out of his fucking mind. But that does mean that running the show costs me probably $800 a month Mm -hmm. opportunity cost. But I love doing it. And if you want to show support, if you want to give back, Sign up to our Patreon, uh, get access to bonus episodes. We just talked about the mystical, secret, ancient, and fake texts that make up the core of theosophy, the book of John. Stanzas of John. Yeah. If you want to get access to that, support the show. Yeah. Go to patreon.com slash the nonsense bazaar and we'll love you forever. I'll put you in my will.
I'll hold her to it. <laughs> <laughs> we got the Seven of Swords. Okay. Futility. <laughs> Moon in Aquarius. Interesting. Yeah. I like it. Thievery. A lot of thievery. Fakery. Yes. Uh, faint. A faint is a, mm-hmm. is a great word for it. A lot of looking over your shoulder to make sure nobody's seeing what you're doing. Yeah. It's de- like, if there was a card that was a psyop, it would be the Seven of Swords. Oh, yeah. This is the card of, like, you know, theft. Yeah. You know, it's literally in the Rider Waite Smith right. deck. It's yeah, the yeah. dude who's. He's making away with as many swords as he can carry. Yeah, it is a card of deception <laughs> of, yeah. What do you uh, need all those swords for, <laughs> sir? So that's interesting. Yeah. And we will talk about that at the end of the episode. Mental manipulation. Yes, very much so. Mm. I saw a woman arrayed in purple and holding in her hand a golden cup. Pulling up a bonnet, the sun was allowed to scorch the men. Henry Geller was born December 20th, 1946 in Israel, which means that he was like one of the first people born in Israel, right? In the, well, in the modern (laughs) nation of Israel. Yeah. The state of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Um, Uri's father was a soldier in the Israeli military, a committed Zionist, took his military duties more seriously than his familial ones. His, Uri's parents split. When he was pretty young. Mm-hmm. Uh, leaving the young lad and his mother, Marguerite, to start anew in Tel Aviv. It was there that Uri stumbled upon a secluded garden replete with a pool of fish that offered solace from the chaos of the world. It was also at this tender age of three that Uri claims to have had his first close encounter of the third kind. A silent, bull-shaped object descending from the sky. A shadowy figure and a blinding ray of light that would forever change his life. Wow. Yeah. Of course, he wouldn't know this until Puara hypnotized. I was going to say, I don't really remember much from when I was three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't remember shit. I think I fell down the stairs once. That's why you don't remember anything. That's true. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, Uri, saying Uri is the hardest thing in the world with my voice the way it is. For some reason, those sounds together. I don't like it. So Uri, de- every time, it's going to make my voice crack. <laughs> Geller demonstrated his There we go. Geller demonstrated his psychic talents early. Uh, He would like routinely guess the outcome of his mother's card games. She'd play cards with friends and shit, and he would be able to tell the outcome before it happened. And he also looked up to his dad, you you know, thinking he was going to follow in his dad's footsteps and be a hero and shit, right? And and divorce a woman after leaving her with a a young child. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if he ever did that. Yeah, I know. Well, growing up, uh, Uri discovered a peculiar talent at school. He could seemingly control the hands of his wristwatch by sheer will alone. However, the trick only seemed to work when people were watching. Which is not what you'd expect, right? Yeah. If you could psychically control a watch, you'd expect like some crazy dude to say that he could only do it when no one's watching. But Uri could only do it when other people were watching. And all the other people were, the kids in his class were like super impressed with this. Mm-hmm. But they kept asking him to like, oh, how do you do the trick, Uri? Like, what's the secret? Oh, you're doing this awesome magic trick. Tell, tell us. And according to Uri, um, he he got bummed by this because it wasn't a magic trick. Yeah. But that's a that's a theme that will 
stay is that like Uri's powers, according to the accounts, assuming they're real, allegedly, just again, just use the word allegedly all the time. It's in front of every sentence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's how that's the legalese. People don't um, believe or people doubt him. We well, the thing is, his powers only seem to work when other people are looking. Mm-hmm. Like there's this. It's like he uses the attention of other people as the power source yeah. or whatever. Yeah. In 1957, uh, Uri Geller moved to Cyprus, the island of Cyprus, with his mother and her new husband, Ladislas. Uri attended Santa, Terra Santa College, and within two months, he had English and Greek down pat. And it was there that he first heard the story of Jesus, as told by his teacher, Brother Bernard. And uh, Uri couldn't help but wonder if Jesus could also make watches move. Yeah. You know, there's nothing like being a Jew and starting to read about Jesus a little bit, feeling all naughty. I could be a super Jew, too. Yeah, right? You left it out, but the part about after leaving the kibbutz, he lived in a, in a kibbutz? He did. Eh? It was, uh, his father, like, founded the kibbutz. So it was a very Zionist community then. Yeah. Intensely. Yeah, yeah. 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 I just wasn't sure when he moved to Tel Aviv, when he moved to the kibbutz, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So, but he did spend some time living in a kibbutz. He did. So, like a communal living situation, very Jewish, very Zionist, more than likely. Yes, very much so. Yeah. But what's weird is that his mom didn't raise him to be religious at all. There is this one weird story I didn't include in the script, but like one of the times that Israel was fighting Egypt, right at the start there, his dad was going to battle and Uri was really worried. And so he prayed really hard. And uh, according to his dad, like the Egyptian tanks were like coming across this ridge or like through this valley or whatever. And they were like prepared for a fucking bloodbath. But all of a sudden it was like all the Egyptian soldiers and shit were just in this like hypnotic trance and in a daze. And they just kind of rolled past them without like even looking at them. Yeah. Yeah. But that's a really odd story. Don't know what to make of that. Well, it's also like third, fourth hand information. So what the yep. fuck can you make of it, right? Truly. Um, and that's the case for a lot of the stories I didn't include in the script. It's like, okay, th- that's cool. But like, I have no way of knowing anything about that, right? Right. Um, well, also on Cyprus in the 1950s, Uri became embroiled in the world of espionage for the first time. See, his uh, stepfather, Ladislas, owned this hotel. Right. And one day Uri was like playing in the attic, not playing. He was a teenager. He was hanging out in the attic. He was jerking off. Yeah. 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 He was. I'm sure. Yeah. And well, he heard voices from the floor below, below. And he like looked down through the cracks on the floors and he saw these two dudes um, talking about like secret Israeli spy shit. One of the dudes, uh, this dude, uh, forgive my pronunciation. I'm going to blame it on my voice. One was this dude, Yoav Shakam, uh, who, who was an Israeli spy. And this dude, uh, Uri, befriended this guy. He, like, made it a point to, like, go and introduce himself and, like, just be his friend, his teenage buddy. And eventually, Uri was like, so, uh, Yoav, I heard you talking about some spy shit a while back. I was in the rafters. I was literally eavesdropping. Yeah. And uh, Yoav's like, oh, Jesus fucking Christ. All right, listen. There's a lot of people... Want us dead. There's a lot of people who want Israel to not fucking exist. We're trying to stop that from happening. It's very dangerous. Please don't tell anyone. And Uri's like, no, nah, I won't tell anyone. Can I be a spy, though? <laughs> and dude's like, yeah, fuck it, why not? And so he em- employs him as like a courier, bringing packages to the dead drop and shit like that, right? Shit that's easier for a teenager to do than for Israeli intelligence to do, right? Right. Yeah. So he started working... For an Israeli spy ring on Cyprus, all at the tender age of 16. Well, under uh, Yoav's like mentorship, Uri eventually joined the Israeli army in 1965, and he volunteered for the paratroopers. His plan was to enlist in officer school and eventually work for Israeli intelligence. Well, one really shitty year, uh, Joab was killed in action, and Uri's beloved dog Joker fell ill and had to be put down. The combination of, yeah, the combination of these events. Mentor and your dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This kind of soured Uri on the idea of officer school and shit. And he was like, fuck it. What's the point? I don't care. Right. I don't really want to be an officer. Fuck this. So he failed out of uh, officer's candidacy tests, like kind of on purpose. And then just returned to paratrooper training. Hmm. 
So he says. Uh, in Puharik's account, more modern uh, tellings of Furry Geller's story has him working for Mossad, like, from this point on. Yeah. Which is the, probably the true one. Mm-hmm. But, again, this is the Andrea Puharik reality tunnel. Well, Uri did fight in the Six-Day War in 1967, in which uh, I believe he killed a man, and he sustained injuries that left him hospitalized. And during his recovery at the hospital, he formed a close bond with uh, this young nurse named Hannah and her brother Shippy. Okay. Yeah. And Shippy became one of the first to witness Uri's watch manipulating powers and the first person to believe that it wasn't a trick. Right? So he's doing this from his hospital bed. Yeah. Okay. He's like, like, he, like, hey, come here. I got I got a trick to show you. Well, he, he just becomes friends with these kids. Like, they're not yeah. much younger than him. Right? And the three of them just become, like, a unit of best friends. Mm-hmm. Well, after he's discharged from the army, Uri works in various jobs until uh, Shippy convinces him to perform his tricks for the public, to put on a show, do the performer thing. And so, Uri Geller, the entertainer, the star, was born. Also, his ass was a model by day. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Day job as a model. Yeah. Okay. I mean, <laughs> there's something just ridiculous about Uri Geller. Mm-hmm. You know? Of course, his ass was a fucking model. Of course. It's just, it's, I think he's a good looking feller. He looks like me, honestly. So. So there you go. Yeah. Back to Andrea Puhark. By the way, audience, just so you understand the scene here, I'm sort of taking shots of NyQuil like it's not NyQuil. <laughs> so. Ugh. We're going to, we're going to see how this goes by the end. Back to Andrea Puhark. It's going to go fantastic as long as Spectra allows it to. I know. You know who else is taking shots of NyQuil like it was not NyQuil? Andrea Puhark. <laughs> so Taking shots of something. Who the fuck knows what it is? Well, actually we do. It's some weird fucking Daytora extract or whatever the fuck. Which yeah. is, which is, Benadryl Quill. Yeah. His ass, uh, his first trip to Israel was in March 1970. And not to meet Uri Geller, but to train a research group at Tel Aviv University uh, in his technique of electrostimulation of hearing for the deaf. His mind control technology. Mm-hmm. You can just, re- every time that comes up, you can just think of it as the mind control technology. Because, come on, even if that's not what it actually is, like, it could be, and so it just is. Fuck it. Yeah, it really seems that way. Yeah. On this trip, he also, like, visited the Qumran site near the Dead Sea, where the Dead Sea Scrolls and the uh, Nag Hammadi Codices were discovered in 1947. And on his way back to Tel Aviv, you know, just to reinforce the religiosity of this whole thing, on his way back to Tel Aviv, Andrea experienced a sudden sleepiness, which he wrote was very mysterious, because he's a very hell, he's never good, that never happens to him. Eighteen months later, he would learn the cause of this mysterious sleepiness. Oh? Yeah. And, and what what was it? The alien menace. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know that I've ever been so sleepy in my life that I can, like, remember it now and think back to it, especially a specific period of time, like, 18 months ago, that time I got really sleepy. Well, if it was, like, the first time you'd been to Israel and you were in Israel again. Yeah, then you might. Yeah, you know? yeah. It was like, oh, it was right before I was going back to the airport. Yeah. Like, I can see that. But also, you know, he's a strapping, strapping man. <clears throat> Have you ever he heard of get tired? You heard of uh, Jerusalem syndrome? No. It's a phenomenon where um, it's a psychotic delusion <clears throat> that's common in people who visit the city of Jerusalem, who then um, start to believe that they're Jesus. Oh, I have heard about that. Yeah, that's interesting. They start to like believe that you know they're Mary Magdalene or that there's some. Wow. So something, they start to develop intense religious delusions. That's super, that's really interesting. <clears throat> Just by being in Jerusalem. I mean, like, it makes sense, sure, but it's still really interesting. Yeah. Well, back in New York, Buhark chaired the conference Exploring the Energy Fields of Man, uh, in which... Israeli uh, scientist Itzhak Bentov, who's another one of these motherfuckers that just shows up. We'll talk about more in depth sometime. He's mentioned in like the CIA report on the Monroe Institute and shit, his theories on consciousness and psi phenomena, how it works and shit. Well, Bentov presented a report at this uh, a parapsychology conference, a report on Uri Geller, and talked about, you know, this crazy Israeli like performing psychic who 
does shit like splitting a gold a gold ring in two while someone's holding it in their hand, moving a wristwatch, moving the hands of a wristwatch like two hours forward by just by waving his hand over it and driving through traffic blindfolded. And that last one is a common mentalist trick. Like, well, the conference scientists were skeptical of Uri's alleged talents because like you never see like, no parapsychologist really believes that it's ever that flashy, right? Surely this must just be a magic trick. Yeah, especially when you're doing the blindfolded driving through traffic stuff, yeah. you know? And like every other psychic that gets studied, like all parapsychology research is like very slippery. It, you never get the flashy shit, the money shot, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, it's like Benton was presenting this report on, oh, there's this Superman, this Israeli wizard who can do impossible shit in front of a lot of people. Also, yeah, kind of a lot of it seems like magic tricks, but he's the real deal. They're like, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Andrea Buharak, however, is like, that's the that's the guy. I got to go get him. Or he goes dead. I got no one else. I got to go see this man. Also, Buharak's home life was going about as well as a spook can ask for, which is to say, not great. Mm, yeah. We didn't mention this in the first episode, but um, Andrea Buharak was married throughout all of that. Everything we talked about last episode. Three times, actually. He went through three wives in the course of last week's episode. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't even go through that many wives in, in a year. I know. Well, this was... The voice cracking is hilarious. <laughs> well, this was like a few decades, to be fair. Yeah. Um, he, he married his first wife, Ginny, in 1943. Yeah, so three decades. That's a wife a decade. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's not too bad. Yeah, it's respectable. Yeah. Respectable turnover rate. Okay. I'll allow it. <laughs> this is, well, they had three kids together, and uh, Ginny also had schizophrenia and was in and out of the hospital for decades. Oh. Yeah. During this time, Buharak also carried on a few affairs, including with the woman who would become his second wife, Bep Herman, from Holland, who started off as an au pair taking care of Buharak's kids while Ginny was in the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they fell in love, and while they were in California, Puharik, in his words, um, quote, stopped in Mexico for a quick divorce from Jenny. Jenny later uh, committed suicide by jumping off the top floor of her father's hospital. Mm. So it goes. Yeah, I mean, I might too if my husband had, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. left me for the, you know, woman that I was entrusting the care of my children to while I was... And, and she hospital. also, like, they get, they made her undergo, like, insulin shock Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Schizophrenia treatment in the 50s? Right. Are you kidding me? Not good. Holy shit. Real not good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bep Herman writes that this devastation. She's, Bep Herman is who wrote the book Memories of a Maverick, which is like the closest thing to a biography you can get of Puhark. Uh, she wrote that this devastated Puhark and that it was the second time she saw him cry tears of utter despair. Yeah, no shit. That'll happen. Um, is Bep short for anything? Yeah, it's some it's some Dutch name. It's some Dutch name. Are we sure it's not short for Buca de Beppo? <laughs> Are we sure? We're not. Okay. We're not sure. No, we're not <laughs> sure. Well, anyway, he cheated on Herman too, and so she divorced his ass and moved with three more kids to Holland. Okay. Yeah, he has six now. He has six kids. <clears throat> Five daughters, one son. I believe. I believe so. Yes. Uh, Puharik and Bep Herman would actually stay on good terms. They'd write letters to each other and shit. She accompanied him, like, uh, she says, like, to find the Amadita muscaria mushroom, shit like that. They'd stay on good terms, and he'd visit her and the kids in Holland and shit. Uh, in 1971, he had just been divorced a third time. This wife was named Nancy. Don't know a lot about her. She punched him in the nose once. Good for her. Before they got married. Mm. So it goes. I, I think he like he he said that he wrote a note in he was gonna call off the marriage and he like for, with his bleeding nose he wrote a note in blood on <laughs> a thing that just said like give up hate or something and like pinned it to her door and he was like oh I'm done with her but then he married her anyway Jesus Christ yeah 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 ew yeah she caught him cheating too of course she did yep so so we find Andrea you keep getting married spook gotta be married actually that yeah. that is kind of a thing. Right? It's just so funny, like, to not be faithful, but still want a spouse that's, right. like, not okay with you not being faithful. Well, the thing is, like, people with security clearances, 
like it is very encouraged. Well, they, they have to compartmentalize parts of themselves. So it's very, it's probably not difficult for them to do. And it's also an important outlet, you know, sex, intimacy, et cetera. And like, realistically, he probably was not an agent or I don't, I don't know, actually. But he wasn't home with his family as right. much as he should have been. So, yeah. Puhark's in the middle of a third divorce. He has his house in Austin, New York. He's got Intellectron Corporation in New York City. He's also teaching at a university in New York. In 1971, he's getting a third divorce. And he's just like, all right, fuck it. I guess I'm going to go meet the spoon bender. Yeah, why not? It, yeah. He gets to Israel and he sees Uri perform one of his shows. He's surprised by his like healthy appearance and gentle manner because he's used to like large, gross, uh, alcoholic Dutchman and shit. Yeah, like, he was living in Holland, right? He wasn't living there, but he was bouncing back and forth to like okay. see the kids and shit. And Peter Herkos was like his one of his only good friends. Okay. Yeah. He was described as vulgar by all the women that came into contact with Peter Herkos, which, you know, he's a loud, dirty, gross Dutchman. Yeah. Yeah. Well, after the show that Puark saw him perform at, like he and Uri agreed to meet privately to discuss research interests and conduct experiments. Uri did not like scientists, and he was not super thrilled about being a research subject, right? He liked attention, but he didn't like um, critique, like that type of attention. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Open skepticism mm -hmm. rather than fascination. Right. But there was something about Buhark that made Uri like him and want to work with him, is what the book says. Later accounts are like, Andrea was sent by the CIA to vet Uri Geller. Was, is what later accounts say. So who knows? Who knows? Spy versus spy. Yeah. It's spy, spies versus themselves, I think is what it... <laughs> that's, that being, that's really what it is. Yeah. Well, at six feet, two inches, Uri Geller was a soft-spoken, sweet, naive feller. He is. And he, he's... Throughout this book, he does have a very, like, innocent, naive, sweet demeanor. Like... I, I do wonder if the movie Zoolander was based off this period of early Uri Geller's life. Have you ever seen that? Uh, well, Zoolander? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course I have. But like that type of fucking himbo male model. <laughs> yes. Just the the, na the sweet, naive He's also innocence. getting um, brainwashed and MK Ultra. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or he's brainwashing an MK Ultra. Yeah. We don't really know. Something about Buhark made Uri trust him and they started doing experiments. Right off the bat, this shit was fucking wild. The first experiments saw Uri Geller telling Puhark to think of a number, which Puhark did. It was 432. And then Uri showed him that he had written the number on a piece of paper, like well before the experiment actually started, thus showing Puhark that he was sending telepathic signals rather than receiving. Well, either that or time is just like nonlinear. Well, that is, that is the thing. Uh, that's part of Uri, like when Puhark like asked him, where do you think your powers come from? Uri talked about like moving faster than light in order mm -hmm. to like go back in time and shit. Wow, There's a lot of okay. light speed time shit in Uri Geller's explanations of his powers at this point. And then later on, we will see the entity talk about moving backwards through time and shit from far, far in the future. But it was also demonstrating that Uri Geller could pull one over on Puhark should he choose to do so was another like point of that demonstration, right? <clears throat> right. Like you you're not necessarily the one in control, Mr. Mr. Scientist man. Yeah. Other experiments saw Uri demonstrating telepathic abilities, guessing numbers, names of cities and colors on a blackboard, and uh he was correct on every attempt. He like blew any other psychic Puhark had studied out of the fucking water. He also displayed a, the rarest and like holy the rarest and most holy grailest of psychic powers, telekinesis. He demonstrated. So that means moving stuff? Moving shit with your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Like Matilda. Exactly. Which like, and all those questions like what superpower would you like? Dude, straight up telekinesis. Like, yeah, that would be really convenient. Like overpowered telekinesis is, you can't beat it. Yeah. Yeah. But he would just move watch hands. That was Jerry's trick, right? But this, well, he repaired a non-working watch without touching it. And he also raised the temperature of one thermometer in the room while others stayed the same without touching it. Like, it'd be easy to just, like, hold it in your hand and do that because, you know, body heat, whatever. Right. But, yeah, he raised the temperature of one thermometer and not the others from across the room. So, Andrea Puark's like, holy shit, this guy's the real deal. I got to get the other scientists in on it. 
He goes back to the U.S. And he tries to like drum up some interest, get some of that patrons, get some of them patrons coming in, giving him money and all this shit like he's used to, you know? Um, no one really cares. The only people that really care are like Captain Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, who uh, Puharik writes had completed the first moon to earth telepathy experiment, which I didn't know they did that. Yeah. Um, wait. <laughs> What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Captain Edgar Mitchell. He's an astronaut. Uh, okay. Yeah. Apparently, according to Buharik, one of the things they did up there on the moon was complete a moon-to-earth telepathy experiment. Holy shit. Yeah. Did it... More Successful. Results? Okay. Yeah. Cool. App- apparently. And Edgar Mitchell is involved in, like, the founding of, like, the Institute of Noetic Sciences and shit as well. Um, a lot of the human potential movement stuff. Well, also down to clown was uh, Itzhak Pentoff, who had given the report on Uri that first got Puhark's attention. So he's got a couple people. It's worth doing. Gets his shit back, and he goes back to Tel Aviv uh, for November 19th, 1971, back to Israel. Yeah, like the biggest telekinesis, psychokinesis thing Uri could do was control clocks and watches. Like that is sort of the hallmark throughout this whole thing. I mean, it's just story after story of passing his left hand over a watch and it's just moving like crazy. Yeah, time seems to be a theme. It is definitely a theme. In one case, they had an assistant, like the, the watch repair case, they had an assistant like hold a broken watch in her hand or he just passes his hand over it a few times until he goes like, okay, I think it, I think something happened. And they look and then it's just, it's just working. And like there are other people just besides Andrea Puhark who say this shit happened. Right, like mm-hmm. Itzhak Bentov, all these assistants. I mean, they vouch for it, which is you know, <clears throat> they do a lot of fucking watch shit, a lot of experiments, and <laughs> I just thought how it's funny, like the name of a watch. It's a literally watch. like <clears throat> it's almost as if by having people look at him while he's doing it, it's obeying the name of the very object itself. Like it's it's telling you, I mean, you know, there's watch. a lot of shit like that in here. You know, it's kind of one of the fucking it's so, things like it's so literal that it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, throughout all of this and like we haven't revealed the big eye in the sky yet, but like a ton of like self-referentiality yeah. and like, you know, weird shit. Yep. We're like, read this book. It is very, very fucking strange. Well, at some point when Itzhak Pentov was working with Buhar and Geller. Geller started getting, like, really frustrated with, like, the highfalutin bullshit these guys were, were spewing all this talk about, like, the evolution of humanity and the soul and all this crap. Uri Geller did not care about that. Uri Geller wanted what Uri Geller wanted. And Uri Geller, Uri Geller wanted money, women, and fast cars. He got them, too. He did. He fucking sure did. This is a quote from him <clears throat> um, expressing that sentiment. Andrea... I've been studying you, just like you've been studying me. I've never known any professors before, so I don't know what's important to them and what makes them tick. As I listen to you, I can't figure out what you're up to. (laughs) You talk about research, the soul, evolution, all these things, and I, I don't get the point. Why is it important to learn about the soul, these powers that I have? All I'm interested in is how to make enough money. So that no one can tell me what to do. I want to be free. I want to have a car so that I can travel when I want to. I want to have my own apartment so that I can know where I'm going to sleep at night. Maybe you don't understand how important these things are to someone who doesn't have them. Hey, Puark didn't. And I also just like Uri Geller saying, I can't figure out what you're up to. <laughs> you know? Um, well, Puhark desperately wanted to hypnotize Uri Geller to find out the source of his powers. Find out or make make Curie find out. If anyone ever desperately wants to hypnotize you, not a good idea. Don't. Yeah, do it. no. Yeah, no, no, that. no. <laughs> well, Uri was very not down at first, saying that he couldn't be hypnotized. People had tried it, it wouldn't work. All this shit, but just like a little like, come on, from Buhark. Uh, Uri finally agreed. So, Buhark and Bentov hypnotized Uri Geller, hoping to find out more about Uri's past and the source of his psychic powers. So they get him in a room and like, you know, despite Geller saying that he couldn't be hypnotized, it just works immediately. He goes into a deep hypnotic trance 
And, uh, and this is a quote from the book. Uh, I asked him to look around and tell me where he was. He said he was in a cave in Cyprus, just above Nicosia, with his dog Joker. I asked him what he was doing here. He said, I come here for learning. I just sit here in the dark with Joker. I learn and learn, but I don't know who's doing the teaching. What are you learning? It's things like I told you last August when we first met. It's about people who come from space, but I'm not to talk about these things yet. Is it secret? Yes, but someday YouTube will know. Dun dun. And then uh, he has him go back to the time before he moved to Cyprus, which is also before he learned English. So where he starts speaking in Hebrew, mm-hmm. Itzhak Pentov takes over the, the session. And then he tells him that like just after his third birthday, he was playing one day in a garden across the street from his house. And Uri looked up from... Uh, you know, playing in the fucking sand like kids do. And he saw a large shining bowl-shaped light in the sky above him. The day was December 25th, 1949. Christmas oh, Day. Yes. yes, yes. Then there was a huge, very bright shining figure in front of him in the garden. The shining figure had no face that could be seen, only a radiant countenance. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Or he gazed at this radiance in total hypnotism. It's kind of like those creepy Amish dolls. You know, the ones that have no faith. Yeah, 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 yeah. Those are creepy. Yeah, you just like put them face in a corner and then you turn them around. There's no face on it. Uh, Those things are creepy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then he became aware of arms slowly moving out from the side of the body of the radiance. The arms were raised over the head of the radiance and then Uri saw that held between the hands was the sun. It was so blazing in its brightness that Uri passed out from the power of its rays with the pain of blindness. It sounds like an angel. That's you know? exactly what I was thinking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. But as the session continued, the hypnosis session, all of a sudden, a new voice started coming from, not exactly from Murray, but from somewhere. It was speaking in English. And Andrea and Itzhak were taken aback by the sudden change in, apparently, Uri's demeanor. The disembodied voice claimed that extraterrestrial beings had programmed Uri to help mankind and warned that Egypt was about to attack Israel. And if it happened, there would be grave and dire consequences for the whole the whole world, like nuclear World War Three. But like, that's all the aliens ever really have to say, isn't it? It really is. It's like, hey guys, getting a little out of control with this war stuff, with this weaponry stuff. No, dude, in like every down. in every alien story we've ever done, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this one gave dates and prophecies and all this shit about how this was going to spiral into a full-on nuclear shooting war. And it was up to Andrea Puhark and Uri Geller to stop it. Oh, please. And they literally say that, like, Uri is the chosen one. Uri Geller. Can you believe it? Of course. That's why he had his vision on Christmas. Right. Yeah. That's why everything happens to Andrea Puhark on Christmas. Well, when the hypnosis session ended, Uri apparently had no memory of what transpired. They recorded it, and Puhark played back tape, parts of the tape for Uri, who started just getting, like, visibly agitated and freaked out and shit then uri just like ejects the tape cassette holds in his hands and it vanishes it just does a fucking appears and then uri geller runs the fuck out of the room and disappears into the night leaving puharik and itzhak bentov just like looking at each other like what the fuck are we doing what is this and they think that uri's not in his right mind Probably not. Because he just got hypnotized. Exactly. They're worried about him getting to a car and doing something fucking stupid. So they run after him. They find him like down a side street or something. They're like, dude, calm down. Like, we don't know what the fuck's going on either. We got to figure it out. He calms down. He realizes like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so he just agrees that like, okay, we got to get to the bottom of this together. Okay? Mm-hmm. And what if it's true? You know? And also at this, Puharik's now just kind of hanging out with Keller going on his like tours and stuff. And one of the tours he was doing was going around to all these uh, military camps and doing gigs for the military. Well, that's fun. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was a, you know, people knew him. He was Uri Geller. He's a star. So a lot of this book is just Uri and Puhark bopping around the desert seeing UFOs. Like a sizable portion. (laughs) Yeah. Well, while traveling through the desert shortly after this, Geller and Puhark noticed an unexplained red light shining off a distant mountain. At first, they thought it might be a hallucination, a product of their own desires to see a UFO, the intense events they'd recently experienced. 
Gorak describes it later as like looking like a giant red eyeball, which reminds me of uh, Barbalith from Grant Morrison's uh, mythology. Big old red eye in the sky. Yeah, just like a, a big fucking red orb, you know? And Baby. Yeah. And uh, what's the likelihood that they're on drugs when they see this thing? I mean, I'm going to say pretty high. Yeah. Well, what made it doubly weird is the driver and the other military dude they're with didn't see it. They're just like, I don't see it. What, what red light? What are you talking about? It's not there. Like, okay. So only those two were seeing it. Yeah. Only Puharik and Geller can, can see it. Creepy. Yeah. Then it starts following their car. And so Puharik and Geller are in the back, like, kind of being, like, they start being like, are we being fucked with by something? Like, these guys don't see this, but you see it, right? Yeah, yeah, you see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is someone fucking with us? Because that's all odd, you know? Yeah. The next day, uh, Uri had a premonition that he would receive a photograph that he would take a picture of a spaceship. Like, he saw himself holding a picture of a UFO, right? He thought that the red light from the night before was connected to the voice that came through the hypnosis session. And, uh, all right, well, one of the things that the voice had told them about the war with Egypt was this word that they didn't know what the fuck it meant. It was Dakashem. They didn't know what the hell it was. And, like, while they're doing this military tour, Uri's talking to, like, military intelligence and shit. And they tell him, like, he says, like, I had a premonition that yeah. this is going to happen, right? He doesn't tell him about the UFO or the voice or anything, but he's just like, I had a premonition this is going to happen. If you know anything about the word Dakashem, look out, right? And, uh, yeah, then the next day after that, Uri says that he's going to have, Uri gets a premonition of holding a photograph of a spaceship, and he calls Buharik and he says, Listen to what happened to me today. After you left me, I took a shower, had lunch, made a lot of phone calls. Then, at exactly 3 p.m., I got a phone call. Wasn't a human voice, but it spoke perfect English. Sounded like the kind of voice that robots use in movies, very mechanical. It said, take the camera that Andrea gave you, use color film, go to Arlesorov Street on the other side of Aelon River, take Shippy, watch the sky, you will see our craft, take a picture. Also, Shippy is like, he, d- he does literally nothing in the story, but he's there the whole time. Shippy's the, he's the mastermind behind all of it. He might he's, be. He's the one pulling the strings on He might actually fucking be. It's like the, the theory that Jar Jar Binks is uh, secretly yeah. the Sith Master. You've never seen the Star Wars. I think, th- I think this is all Shippy's doing, actually. Could be. That's my favorite That's theory yet. There. Yeah. Apparently, he's like, th- this kid Shippy is just like a psychic battery for Uri Geller, though. Like, his powers are just stronger when this dude's there. Yeah. It's weird. And indeed, Uri went to that spot, saw a UFO, took a picture of a big-ass UFO that looks like a big brown blob, but it was a big-ass UFO. Now, this is so hard. Yeah. Puarik approached Uri about, like, cooperating with the military, telling him more about the uh, premonitions about the war with Egypt and all this shit. Uri eventually agreed when he understood that, like, oh, shit, there could be a nuclear shooting war. But... Puark did tell Uri to just not tell them about the UFO shit, right? Fearing that public association with UFOs would discredit their work and compromise their research. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Uh, December 4th, 1971, Andrea Puhark and uh, Itzhak Bentov found themselves discussing the curious phenomenon of disappearing and reappearing objects. Mm-hmm. They wondered if Uri's power is his own or if it's controlled by extraterrestrials. How'd they get on that path of thought? Just because, well, like... Well, they're channeling aliens, so... Yeah. Now, where do these powers come from? And Uri doesn't actually seem to have that much control over it. Yeah, or understanding of, like... Yeah. Where they come from. The technique, or when he's feeling things, when he's not. And Uri, in fact, confesses that he's never been able to control his power before the December 1st hypnosis session. And he suspects that the voice, whatever it is, might have a hand in this. Hmm. Yeah. It's aliens. It's always aliens. Well, Buharik and Bentov decide to test uh, Uri's, like, object disappearing abilities using a Parker ballpoint pen, which they disassembled. They took all the parts, marked it with code numbers. Then they put the pen back together, put it in a box. Uri waves his hands over it. They open the box, and the inner components of the pen are gone. Yeah. Just completely gone. That type of shit just happens throughout this, throughout the whole fucking thing. And so then they're like, this is well beyond just normal psychic shit. I've studied a lot of psychics. This shit doesn't happen. 
So they put Uri into another hypnotic trance trying to contact the voice. Which they do, and the voice says it's from a spacecraft called Spectra hovering above the Earth. The tape recorder, the tape recording this also uh, jams and the tape gets destroyed. Funnily enough, all the tapes of the uh, the voice that happened throughout all this, they all either vanish or just get destroyed. Yeah, just disappeared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very. But it's okay because Buhark has a good memory and he's a, a scientist, you understand? So you can trust oh, him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he can just record everything there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He does write it like you should just believe him. It's kind of fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Ballsy. Yeah. December 7th, um, they're informed that Israeli scholars have actually cracked the, cracked the meaning of the word Dakashem, and it was the Egyptian invasion plan's codename. It referred to, like, an ancient city now no, no longer extant, and, yeah, it was like an Egyptian word, that. A place? It used to be a place? Yeah. Yeah, it used to be a place. It, it An ancient city that was once, a, like, that was now part of Israel, but was once part of Egypt. Right. You know? But now they have confirmation that, like, this voice gave them actionable information, right? Mm. Because, like, if you take their take their word for it and, like, this shit actually happened, right? If it gives you an enemy force's plan f- for an invasion, like the name of it, the secret name, that's something. How do they know any of this is, is real or if it's just, like, how do they know that the alien's not fucking with them? Well... Why do they just implicitly trust it? I don't know. I really don't. I like if we take Puharak at his word, it seems like he was going through a rough time and he just wanted someone to give him guidance. Yeah. It's kind of how it reads because he's just all of a sudden all in on just following the whims of this mysterious voice. Yeah. It's kind of ridiculous. It's kind of psychotic. Yeah, it is. It's batshit crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Like batshit crazy. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of this one Dr. Phil episode where this lady thought that the, the radio was communicating with her and, like, giving her direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, she'd be listening to a song and it'd be like, since you left me. And so she'd be like, oh, I have to take a left turn. Like, and oh, my she would, God. She'd just take herself on these crazy adventures thinking that the radio was, like, oh, dude, like that's her That's what they start doing. Yeah. Except they're not using a radio. They're doing something even fucking they're crazier. They're, like channeling it. No, they're using a wristwatch. Yeah. Yeah. They're getting, like, the numbers, how the wristwatch changes as, like, information and shit. Right. It's fucking psychotic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very. Yeah, like, it is pure fucking madness. Yeah. Dakashem. Yeah. Well. So, Park and Geller go to the spot where they already took the picture of the spacecraft, trying to contact the fucking thing again. This is also why it's so hard, because these are, this is psychotic shit, and you're trying to tell a narrative about it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my voice sounds like this. This is so hard. Okay. We have to do this. We have to. So, Puharik, like, oh, yeah. So, yeah, they, they get the voice. Tape vanishes. Gets destroyed. Yeah. So, later on that night, after they he- first hear about Spectra, Uri starts, like, absentmindedly doodling a spaceship. that has, like, yep. fins on it and shit. He later identified as, like, oh, that's part of Spectra. And then at exactly 9 p.m., Uri, Andrea, and Iris, Uri's girlfriend at the time, saw a luminous spacecraft with side fins in the sky outside their window. It looked just like Uri's drawing. Whoa. Yeah. That'd be creepy. That, like, think about how scary that would be if you were just, like, doodling little UFOs in your journal and then that night. Oh, yeah. You know, you're hanging out and your significant other's like, what's that in the sky? And you look outside and it's... The thing that you the were UFO drawing you've earlier? been drawing, yeah, 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 yeah. No, that'd be ridiculous. Terrifying. It's fucking terrifying. So during this hypnosis session, Spectre said, "Oh, we're gonna rendezvous, like physically, that spot that you took the photo at." Yeah. Yeah. Go there. We'll meet you there. It'll be sick. It'll be a good time. They go there, and they're standing there. Puark's getting his shit set up, and then both Uri and Iris's watches stop and then move forward one hour. Which they just intuitively interpret the UFOs changing the predicted meeting time. So they go back to Iris's apartment where they watch Uri uh, hard boil three eggs in his hands without heat. Impressive. The most impressive trick so far in my book. 
unless they were already hard boiled before. Shut the fuck up. How dare you? They might have been already hard boiled. <laughs> they might have thrown the fucking raw ones in the trash. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine if Eric Geller's just walking around with three hard boiled eggs in his pocket at all times. Right. That's, that's commitment well, to the bit. It would be clever if, like, you know, all he would have to do is have one that's real, crack it open, say, see, these are all real eggs, and then just, you know, have the three hard boiled ones. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wicked true. He's well, a clever little fellow. What if Buhark's just in full psychosis and Uri Geller's just stringing him along? Yeah. Just digging him deeper into psychosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uri's his, Uri's his handler. What if Uri's Buhark's handler? What if he is? The, mm, you know? And Shippy's there to help. Meanwhile, Puhara kind of thinks that he's in charge. Wow. But he's not. I'm a little too high on cough medicine to think clearly, but I'm trying to go back through all the events in my head. It's entirely possible. Yeah. It's entirely fucking possible. I mean, all right. who put the idea in Puhara's head to go over and meet Geller to begin with? Bentov. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Israeli scientist. It designed Israel's uh, first rocket, Pantoff did. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if the nonsense bizarre ever disappears, you know it was Mossad. So, <laughs> 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 sorry. Didn't want me to blow up your spottery. But... The, the eggs are totally real. I, I like, totally believe the egg thing. It's so funny if, the, if it was just the eggs that made us realize the whole fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'll put putting back on the credulity caps. No. I was also thinking about the temperature thing earlier, how he could make one get like raised yeah. higher than the other. I wonder like would he point out I'm going to make that one um you oh, know, that I don't go know. higher. And then whoever's supposed to be observing would then go and stand near it, right? And if enough people were standing around one specific temperature gauge, would they could they that would be such poor science. I don't think they did it like that. Yeah. I wonder how they did that. But there I wonder were, um, if just the, the body heat of someone standing next to the temperature gauge, like breathing on it, looking closely at it, would be enough to make it raise a, a degree. I'm pretty sure they would control for that. Yeah, um, probably. But there, there were other... Because that was like a big thing that Puhark wanted to see is if Uri could direct his shit. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And uh, there was other experiments too, which showed that, yeah, you could like direct it in a beam. Mm -hmm. Um. I forget what he was had him knock over. It was like something like knocking over little objects or something with his mind. Cool. Yeah, tell him yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. he's Matilda. He is. Aw. After they boil the eggs, they uh, get in the car to go meet the aliens using their watches as like divinatory objects. I love it. It's madness. It's sheer fucking madness. So Buharik just starts choosing directions based on what their wristwatches are doing. They arrive at a dump near high-rise apartments on the outskirts of Tel Aviv under an overpass, and they start hearing cricket-like sounds and seeing a pulsing blue light. Does that remind you of anything? Well, it, it reminds me of our Havana Syndrome episode. Yes, it sure does. The sound of crickets, a pulsing blue light, and perhaps a focused beam that can raise temperatures and transmit voices. Yeah. Yeah. Sure kind of fucking sounds like whatever caused a fantasy syndrome, but who knows? Well, Uri goes and he meets the light alone. He says, he's like, stay here. I have to do this by myself. He walks away for five minutes, comes back and he's in like a trance like state. He's completely dazed. He's just been through something, you know? I like to think that the blue light is actually just like another Israeli agent who has like a little flashlight and he just yeah, yeah, pulses yeah. it a few times to be like, all right, Uri, come over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like probably. Yeah. That's all it is. So he's like, oh, the blue light, and then goes over. He's like, all right, man, now I'm going to go over there and act all fucked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're actually hitting Puharik with the fucking yeah. mind gun or whatever. Right. Yeah. I so don't know. Who knows? Just, who knows? I, yeah, it's a fun reading. It is a fun reading of it because it's way more realistic, too, because you read this book and it's like Puharik is losing his fucking mind. He's also having the delusions of like religious del religious delusions of grandeur and shit. Yep. Like he's being strung along very like yeah, American yeah. psyop. Very much like that, actually. Very much. Yeah. Interesting. So they drop off Iris, go back to Puharik's apartment, and then Uri's like... Okay, I didn't tell you this when you were in the car because I didn't want to freak Iris out. Some weird shit happened to me. I was only gone for like five minutes, right? It felt like an eternity. 
I was walking down these fucking hallways. It was nuts. Anyway, that Spectre thing, that UFO, that's kind of what people have thought of as God. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where my powers come from. You know, like Jesus's powers and shit. Which, if you remember, last week, what got Buharik up to Maine in the first place was Joyce Balakovic talking to him about, like, what if Jesus was just a psychic with powers and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so now it's a religious thing. I've already seen the light. He's communed with the light. He's walked through astral halls. Turns out Spectre is God. Sick. And as we said, curiously, there is no record of any of this except for what Puharik wrote in his book. But they do try to reconnect with the intelligence through another transession on December 9th, and we will now reenact the transcript. Puharik wrote, Every session that we had to date was a one-way affair in which we were subject to seeing or hearing a brief message and then it was cut. We tried to figure out some way of opening up a dialogue that was meaningful to us within our human framework. We came to the conclusion that we must try once again the proven technique of trance induction and to make the contact and then ask our questions. And so they did on the evening of December 9th. Uh, Park. Please ask if I can use the tape recorder. I'm alone here. There's no one to ask the question of. Then I heard a voice, not from Uri, for he was asleep. The voice had no source. Andrea, I have told Uri to come to me now. May I use the tape recorder? If you do not want to lose this fourth cassette, you will not record. The tape recorder was placed aside. Take this, Uri. Hand it over to Andrea. I opened Uri's clenched left hand. There was my missing earphone from my Sony ICR-100 radio in its leather case. It had been translocated from wherever I had lost it weeks ago, most probably New York City. You've done everything. Do as Uri says. How are you feeling? How's your energy? My energy is tops. I feel as though I am in my 20s again. May I ask some questions purely for my own needs? Yes. Proceed. Are you one of the nine principals that once spoke through Dr. Vinod? Yes. Are you behind the UFO sightings that started in the United States when Kenneth Arnold saw the nine flying saucers on June 24, 1947? Yes. When did you first notice me? In 1946. Why was I noticed? Computers studied everyone on Earth. You were noticed for your abilities as the ideal and perfect man for this mission. What is this mission? Do not ask. It will be revealed. Hurry, be prepared. Be wise. Be calm. Calm down. There's a very, very heavy task on your shoulders for the next coming 50 years. There's a lot to be done to help the universe. The cosmic brain will be sent to you. Andrea, I am sending Uri back to you now. Do whatever he wants. Take care of him. May I ask one more question? Yes. Do you have a name? Yes, but it is not to be revealed to you yet. This answer made me realize that Spectro was not the name of the being with whom I was speaking. How can we communicate with you? You cannot. We will reach you. We can command any communication system man has devised to reach you, so be alert. We will use your tape, phone, radio, television, telegram, letters, computers, and so on. Farewell. Communication ended at 11.09 p.m. Puark writes directly following this. When Uri awoke, I repeated to him my, from my notes what was said. He did not seem interested. He said, Andrea, I don't like to think all these heavy things. I'm here to do things for people. You're here to think and speak. I would rather not hear about these things. I have to remain simple, like a child. <laughs> I get really depressed if I have to think hard about anything for any length of time. I understand. Uri, it is a heavy burden we have taken on. But we must do it joyfully. Like servants who sing at their work, we must not take ourselves too seriously. You're right, Andrea. God can do anything he wishes. We've seen enough to already know this. Then why does he need us? You know, in the battle for the Golan Heights, we had fighter aircraft, helicopters, tanks, all kinds of complex machines. But do you know the only creature or thing that could go up the steep mountains was the donkey? You and I are donkeys. If we keep that in mind, we'll carry our burden lightly. You and I are donkeys. Yep. Yep. So they go off to try and save the fucking world. Allegedly. Amazing. So 
Uri, Puharik, Shippi, and others visit the Oak of Mamre, Mamre, an ancient tree associated with biblical Abraham. And they wondered if it was Spectre who visited Abraham at the Oak, and they decided to use Andrea's watch as a medium for the answer. The, wa- the watch moved forward 29 minutes, indicating... Spectre, are you God? Are you, are you the God of Abraham? Watch moves forward. Yes. As they drive, they see a disc-shaped craft with a red light. Their car shuts down. That standard-ass UFO shutting down your car thing, right? And they're, so they're not scared by it or anything. They're just like, all right, cool. Yeah. And this is when Puhark begins to call the voice uh, the intelligence in the sky, or IS. Uh, intelligence in sky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Back home, Uri discovers Andrea's camera case in his bedroom, which was originally 6,000 miles away back in New York. Like, shit from Puhark's house in New York is just now showing up at fucking well, his apartment in, in Israel. Yeah. Curious. Yeah. Sh- yeah, sure is. It's puzzling, in fact. But they just attribute it to God. Now now they've got, oh, it's oh, just yeah. God. God didn't do anything. So they keep following the- Sky intelligence. Yeah. So leading up to Christmas, because like part of the dates had like December 26th as the last day. Like if you get past December 26th without a war between Egypt and Israel, everything's going to be fine. Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh. So as- Fun. Yeah. Christmas Eve shows up and they've been like praying nightly- for peace in the heart of the Egyptian president and shit and doing all this stuff, just really going all in, you know. Um, on Christmas Eve, uh, Puhark decides to go to Bethlehem to pray for peace, you know, where Jesus was born. When he gets there, there's like all this security and shit because of the heightened tensions, because of all this shit. And you had to have your like passport cleared weeks in advance to get in. Puark gives a little, come on, and they just let him in. Yeah. Yeah, which is odd. As a lot of shit like that keeps happening as well. As almost as if they're being watched by an intelligence. Almost as Almo- if. Almost as if, yeah. But he does, and he thinks a lot about baby Jesus. He goes in to the grotto of the fucking nativity. He thinks a lot about little baby Jesus, and he's praying, and he's praying. And he meets up with Uri at midnight. His watch is, has been stopped the entire day. He doesn't know if his prayers are working. However, they find under his pillow a gold star of David necklace on a chain. It's a sign. Yeah. Then they thought saw three bright blue flashes in the sky and thought it was a sign that everything was going to be okay. It's a Hanukkah miracle. Yeah. The next day, Christmas Day, 1971, Puhark's watch was again doing all sorts of crazy bullshit, bouncing back and forth. And Uri, who was with Puhark, realized that for the first time he kind of accepted that, yeah, I'm not actually a psychic. It's actually the intelligence in the sky. It's actually Spectra. It's actually something else doing it. The Nine, whatever the fuck you want to call him. God. Puhark was, like, glued to the news all day, waiting for... Because, like, it is true. Like, Egypt was building up forces to go to war. Like, it it wasn't just, like, some shit that no one else was aware of. Like, it was the the thing, right? Yeah, so this wasn't just a random guess, like, pick two countries and predict, like, oh, there's no. going to be a war soon. This was very personal. Right, like, this was... Puharic. Well, this personal to Puharic, and also, like, there were a ton of tensions between Egypt and Israel. Like, yep. everyone was on edge. That's why there was security everywhere and shit, right? Egyptian forces were massing at the border. Like, the shit could go down. What the intelligence was telling them that they didn't know just from existing was that, like... This thing could turn into nuclear World War Three if it happens right now, right? <laughs> right. So he's glued to the news all day. And the next day, the same, he's glued to the news and he's, there's no sign of any attack. You know, that night he's sitting in the dark watching a storm outside. There's no sounds indicating the bad, bad thing is going to happen. And then Puharik sees a, uh, a bright star due south, which twinkled brightly with an array of colors and hovered over Tel Aviv. He tried to take a picture of it, but what do you know? It, 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 the camera trigger locked when he, whenever he pointed it at it. Uh-oh. Yeah. and But the light repeated the cycle of turning on and off seven times That's before disappearing. Yeah. As he noted in his diary, uh, Puharik felt that the light appeared to assure him that all was well. Two days later, he read that there would be no war. Puhark didn't know why Egyptian President Anwar Sadat reversed his policy, nor did he know why the Israeli government didn't launch a preemptive attack despite the Arab threats. Now, if you know your 20th century history, you know that a couple months later, Egypt did go to war with Israel. 
like it actually like it actually did happen. Uh. And Puhark and and Geller go into trance again, call up Spectra, and they're like, "Is this the bad bad thing? Should we do? What do we have to do?" And the intelligence says, "Like, oh no, this is just like a normal ass war. The danger's past. Don't worry about it. Just let them fight it out. It's fine." Okay. Yeah. It was only the, that string of dates. If it happened then, it would turn bad. But now you don't have to worry about it. So then he goes on to relate a bunch of the like lessons that they learned through the intelligence, usually through a hypnotized Uri Geller and a mechanical voice. And the tapes were usually destroyed. And this is a transcript from another one of their sessions. Was Arigo one of your subjects? Yes. Do you need proof? The best proof for me is to have him tell me about my ears. Arigo says that he tried to cure your left side. Why did you stop taking his medicines? Um, I became allergic to the streptomycin, and I stopped that part of the treatment. He says to start the same medicines again. It will not hurt you this time. Arigo says he was not hurt in the car crash. There was no pain. He left his body before the crash. He'll bring back something for you. Thank you, and Arigo. I do not know your name. How shall I address you? We've been calling you the Intelligence from the Sky, or IS. You may use the name Spectra. But actually, Spectra is the name of a spacecraft which we use as you use a planet. It has been stationed for the past 800 years over the Earth. It is as big as one of your cities on Earth, but only you can see us. Why are you interested in the Israelis? The Israeli territory is where we first landed on Earth. That is why we are interested in them. Be patient. For years, you will have everything in time. Are there other people on Earth with whom you work? There is no other on Earth that we will use for the next 50 years but you and Uri. 50 years, that would be 2022. It's us. It's not us. I don't know. I'm a terrible psychic. Yeah, you don't think Spectre wants to work with you? Actually, I mean, the last couple of weeks have kind of proven it does, but I don't want it. Yeah. I don't want this bullshit. You're not going to accept that job offer. I hate it. I hate it so much. No channeling Spectra for us. Listen to me. The alien menace doesn't want this to come out. It's true. It's just true. <laughs> <laughs> After this transmission, the tape vanished. On February 9th, 1972, Arian Puhark made another contact via the tape recorder. It went as follows. What is bothering you? We need some clarification about what our work is about. You must be patient. Very patient. You're working 24 hours a day for us, but you don't even realize it. You're in Albury. It is not important where you live. You must be on Earth only wherever you are. How is my mind being used? Your mind is being used 24 hours a day in a way that we cannot yet explain to you. You feel it now by being tired and sick, but this will not last for too long. Did you cause the blackout in Israel on January 14th of this year? The power failure in Israel is from us. What do you make of the power failure? It is a matter you will not yet understand. Where will Uri and I be this year? I can only tell you that you'll be in the USA part of the time. Handle Uri gently. He has nothing to worry about. Can we go aboard your space, spaceship in order to start learning more about you? It'll be a long time before this is possible. Perhaps years. We're not ready for you yet. We are learning a lot. When will the knowledge book come? The reference to the knowledge book is based on a previous conversation not here recorded. The knowledge book is a document which contains information important to man's future. See page 176. In due time, it may take years, but when it comes, it'll be the most historical event that man will ever receive. I received a phone call from you on February 5th at 5 p.m. at the Hilton Hotel. You said, Spaceman over West Germany, Spaceman over West Germany. That was all. What does this mean? We noticed them over West Germany. We wanted to talk to you about it. <laughs> I spoke to you on the phone about it, said it two times. We need your help in Germany. Spaceman, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? I mean, there's spacemen over West Germany. <laughs> 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 what what can we do? We are quite helpless. We will go to Germany. <laughs> we will tell you when. Are Uri and I in any danger? No, nobody knows about you there. 
Why is my Horus Hawk gone? The Hawk was your guard. You are being guarded in an entirely different way. Is this about a Horus Hawk? <laughs> yeah, so at this time, too, they're still doing the, like, military gig thing. Mm. Um, Puharik and Uri go on a wild trip through Israel where, and I'm condensing greatly, it's nothing about hawks and UFOs. Puharik starts seeing visions of hawks constantly, and he thinks he's seeing one particular hawk that he names Horus. He, like, asks Uri if hawks are, like, Uri says that hawks aren't native to Israel, but they are. Like, it's, they take it to be <laughs> really weird that they're not, that they're seeing hawks, but it's not weird at all. Right. It's not weird. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I believe Puharik mentions that it's not actually weird, but it was weird to him. But he thinks he's seeing the same damn hawk just show up whenever, like, some weird shit's about to go down. And he names it Horus. How does he know it's the same one? He just knows. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. And he knows when it shows up in New York, too. Of course. Yeah. He's losing his damn mind. It really seems like that. It really does. Also, Israeli intelligence is just kind of wondering who the fuck this Puharik guy is. According to Buharik, um, at a certain point, he's told that, yeah, he's what the kids call sus as fuck, and he should probably get the fuck out of the country. So he does. Beat the to Europe when he starts writing this book. And then his, like, assistant gets a call from a strange woman who says that the Israeli military doesn't have any desire to arrest him. It's cool. He can go back. But, of course, this woman didn't really exist. There was no call logs, no way to call back, because it, w- it wasn't some Israeli woman. It was Spectra. Oh, my God. So he goes back. phone call. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's his, like, assistant who who gets it and relays it to him. Yeah. So maybe he's just making up the assistant. Who knows? If he's on fucking Deter, if he's taking, if he's getting high on his own supply, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he's just imagining people all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have no idea. He goes back, he goes back to Israel, all sorts of truly bizarre things start happening. He's getting phantom pages on his pagers, Quark's keys to his home in New York, like, appearing on a table in Israel in front of three other witnesses. Uh, Uri Geller telling him he can't stay at his house because it's been wired to shit with surveillance tech by uh, Shin Bet, the uh, domestic intelligence service in Israel, FBI equivalent. Okay. <clears throat> On April 14th, they get more information from the intelligence in the sky. We have a short script for you. General guidance. Go to the United States. Your work will be in Europe. Work starts in Germany with a man chosen. Main base henceforth is in Israel. Detailed instructions on June 1st. Uri will have his powers wherever he is. Do a movie on Uri. Melanie is the one to do it. Work at it. It will come out at right time. You are not to entrust anyone with the secret of our existence. No one. Do not interfere with our educational Israel army program. We will contact you once more before you leave Israel. We showed ourselves to you in the sea by the hotel on April 11th. Why did you allow my journals to be taken by the Shin Bet? Don't ask. Where should you, where should Uri and I be on June 1st? You'll get instructions. How can Uri and I contact you if we need help when there is danger? There will not be danger. But if I think there is danger, will the hawk appear? Sure, you're right. Since you do not show yourselves on Earth, will we be transported to your environment so that we can meet directly? Someday, Yes. Of the people who have been exposed thus far to your powers, who should we continue to work with? Only three. Uri, Shimshan, <laughs> and you. We cannot use our full powers unless you and Uri and Shimshan are together. There is a dematerialized aspect to your atoms that we can use. Farewell. I had no idea what that means. Like, I, I, together they make the Holy Trinity. I guess so, yeah. On April 16th, Puharik fucks off out of Israel and back to the States before a scheduled meeting with Uri in Germany. He has a layover in Athens where he's like stopped by a TWA worker that says his ticket has vanished and he's not on the boarding manifest, which he attributes to the intelligence in the sky, like hiding him because they let him on the plane anyway. I don't know. This is all just fucking madness. Yeah. Well, back in the U.S. at his home in Austin, New York, Puharik gets a call from Uri saying that... Uri got a letter from Puharik saying Puharik got delayed and won't be able to meet Uri in Germany until September or October. But Puharik never wrote the letter. Uri thought he had and was miffed because he was like on the plane to Rome when he read it. So he put it in his breast pocket. When he touched down, it was gone. So this must have been the promised instructions from the intelligence. Ah. 
Puharik interprets this to mean that he's supposed to stay in the U.S. for three more months. And he uh, does and he forms a team to carry out a scientific research program on Uri Geller. The team included Melanie Toyofoku, who was making a documentary film about Uri that Melanie spoke of. Um, Carolyn White, who uh, Carolyn White coordinated university research efforts, efforts. Solveig Clark, who worked part-time in publications, and Sidney Crystal, who handled legal tasks. The group aimed to alert the scientific world to Uri's powers in telepathy, clairvoyance, and psychokinesis. Captain Edgar Mitchell raised funds for Uri's first validation research, and Puharik mobilized and informed scientists from the Life Energies Conference of 1970. However, still, most people thought it was complete bullshit, or they thought Uri was the devil. <laughs> Oh, Generally, yeah. yeah. But remember, like, before all the Egypt war stuff and the Chosen One shit, Puark went over there to, like, get Uri Geller to come back to the States to do a research project. Like, that was the whole reason, right? Which is why we're back on this train. Right. Yeah. Because that never really happened. No, no. Then he gets on some fucking Jesus trip. Yep. It gets real weird. In an effort to gain support for further research on Uri Geller... Puharik and his team attempted to involve the U.S. National Science Foundation and the White House, but uh, their efforts were unsuccessful. They wrote letters for funding. They didn't get responses. <laughs> but eventually, Puharik um, started talking to our boys, Hal Putoff and Russell Targ, over at SRI, who were... And this is like the good old days, too. Pat Price is alive. Yeah, Pat Price and Ingo Swan and Ingo Swan's a cranky bitch. They're having a good old time. Man, I'm just thinking of like... Puharik and Geller like walking into the the good old party the SRI's boys are having like <laughs> these disheveled oh, yeah. lunatics and shit. They've been wandering through the desert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. UFOs taking God knows what. Oh, that's right. Fucking Ingo Swan hated Uri Geller. <laughs> of course he did though. Yeah. You know? Ingo's still my favorite psychic. Mm -hmm. I love him. <laughs> but Hal Putoff and Russell Targ were super down to bring Uri Geller to Stanford. Uh, they agreed on experimental design on experiment designs. They got SRI funding and support. They set a target date for the experiments in November of 1972. Meanwhile, in Germany, Uri Geller was becoming a fucking superstar outside of Israel. He was getting media coverage and he was living a luxurious lifestyle. Fast cars, apartment, okay. women. Yeah. In late August, uh, Buar called Uri to the U.S. to meet the scientists. However, Uri's doesn't really know, again, how he feels about doing this research thing. He's kind of got everything he's ever wanted in Germany right now. And they're trying to, like, make a movie about him. He's going to get studied by scientists. He doesn't know if this is what the fuck he wants or, like, what his place is in any of this. He starts feeling like there's two powerful forces fighting over him, and he questions the motives behind all the strange experiences they've had. He said, uh... Here you are, all of you. You've been working for months on this movie script. All my life I wanted and waited for a movie about me. Now it's almost here and I don't want it. What's wrong with me? Why am I so unhappy? <laughs> Look at the chance I now have to progress in my career, yet something's wrong. Why am I behaving this way? I now feel that something big has to happen and I don't know what. I know it's not this movie or Mitchell or science. Are there two powers here who are fighting over me? They disturb some other people. They disturb us here. They're so powerful. We have no idea why they're here. Look, I have some little powers by myself, but the big powers come from above. There's something funny about them. I still find it very funny that they'll transport a bottle of cologne from Andrea's room on the 14th floor of a hotel down to the dining room in the basement think somebody's playing games with us. Perhaps they're a civilization of clowns. Or maybe one of their clowns escaped, and he's playing some jokes with us. Or, and now I'm coming to the main point. The things that happen, like a fork bending, this has no connection with anything. They don't live in time. Who knows where they came from? They appeared on Earth thousands of years ago. And they're not here to take us over. They're here to teach us something in our stupid and idiotic way, which is why they appear to be clowns and idiotic. They're performing for us at our level. It's like it. Yeah, yeah. August 27th at Puharik's house, Uri's staying there. 
August 27th, 1.01 a.m., Uri's staying at Puharik's house in New York. Um, a large conch shell on a shelf near Uri levitated and slowly fell to the floor. Then the voice of the IS started overdubbing on the tape at 1.03 a.m. Uh, as follows. Andrea, tape will disappear. For five and a half months, we have left you alone. You did quite a nice job, but there have been some problems. You've gathered many people. All your friends that have been gathered must work in harmony. Andrea, have you been scared? No. Are you prepared? Do you have any fear? Are you ready for the work? I am ready for any work. Ari and Andrea, listen carefully. We hope to land on your planet in a few years. We're seen more and more by people. We'll enter your orbital system through word lost transformation and be able to enter your environment. You may not understand this. No, I do not. One of our failures is that we cannot contact you directly. We can only talk to you through Uri's power on the tape recorder. It is a shame that for such a brilliant mind, we cannot contact you directly. Maybe in time, we, we shall be able to contact you directly. In other places, you use the telephone, radio, television, etc., etc. Will you still use these? Yes, when that is needed. Shall I go back to Germany with Uri? We always keep you in contact. You are always together. You must be where the people are who support and help you. This afternoon we heard the movie script. We used Uri to speak, although neither he nor any of you was aware of this. It's a brilliant movie. But not the story we want. We want to prepare Earth for our landing, a mass landing. We landed in South America 3,000 years ago. I thought you landed in fucking uh, Israel. Don't worry about it. And now we must land again. We want you to tell our story, what you call the UFO experience. Use all the collected data and literature. How do we know which is the relevant or true data? Research the data published. You will know what is correct. Write the movie script carefully, slowly, properly, and cleverly. Are you landing on Earth to help mankind? Yes, but also to help ourselves. <laughs> Therefore, we must land and reveal ourselves. We draw our power from this solar system. When will you land on Earth in local Earth time? We will not reveal to you our timetable in landing on Earth in your local time, maybe some years or sooner. In 1952, I was contacted through Dr. Vinod by the Nine. Are you part of them? Do you remember exactly what happened in 1952? Yes, on December 31st, 1952, I was contacted by the Nine through the voice of Dr. Vinod. The message started out, we are nine principles and forces, personalities, if you will. The equation was... Do you list the equation? Yes, that was us, but in different units. We are under their control. You faithfully scribed his words. The real important work is to come. The knowledge book is the main work. Shippy will find the book, then Uri, then you. You have many years of work on it, then it will be released. One of your Earth scientists, Einstein, knew about us. Just before he died, he knew the secret. You will carry on the work, then in centuries, another and another, to keep the data rolling until mine, until man finds infinity. Then all the lights went out and a bright white light blasted through Park's window. Spooky. That is fucking spooky, you know? That would scare me. It, this is also like, this really reminds me of like the John D. Edward Kelly bullshit. Yeah. You know? <sighs> Throughout history... Some weird intelligence in the sky is just starts fucking with two people. It is literally a tale as old as time. Later, another message that again started with saying that the tape will gradually disappear, which is literally this tape will self-destruct. <laughs> yes. The voice reveals that they were also the thing that sent the logheads to find Puharic in Mexico. Also that they need to land to refuel for about two or three weeks. and It'll be a big deal. Also, their home, Hoover, is 16,000 times bigger than Earth. Holy shit, Hoover's huge. Yeah, that's a, that's big. And that Puharik is not allowed to do any science with Uri yet. But it's super, super important that they make a movie about him. Yeah. Meanwhile, the documentary is going nowhere. A new movie producer had contacted Uri in Germany. Werner Schmidt. He wanted to make a musical about Uri. Brilliant. Which Puharik thought was very stupid and childish compared to the documentary. But the damn voice came through a tape recorder again and said it loved the idea of a musical. Of course it did. Of course the aliens loved yeah, the musical. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Uh, is Uri to go ahead with Werner Schmidt? Werner Schmidt is the man we have sent over. We have done and given him many signs, and he was checked out as a positive man. The man has been a very hard-working man, and we think that he has chosen to work with you and help you. Drew Puhari, what we're about to say is going to be new to you, and you must listen carefully and closely. Everything that has been done and said until today has been very important for us, but many changes have been made. We've been checking out all the human race, and we came to the conclusion that only panic and disaster may appear when we land on your Earth in a few years. We wanted to give you and test you how deep and conscious you can go in telling the human race that we people exist. We creatures, as you call us in science fiction terms on Earth. And it's been very hard on you, on Uri, on Shippy, and everybody concerned with this whole project. You've done a good work, but many things have happened in the last month that only shows that the human race is an anxious and unacceptable race. Andrea Puharik, Uri Geller, and Shimshon Strang... We still need your will of mind for our purposes. We shall keep on using you from today, from today, from today. You will be completely independent. You shall decide for yourselves. You shall go on with work, the way you will figure it out, the way you will figure out that is the best. But you must stay in close contact with us. Go ahead with your questions. Are you reversing the position you took on August 29th, 1972, that the mass landing would not cause panic, would be safe? No reverses are taken. There shall be landings on Earth, but the landings might be invisible and only visible to you. Will we still have to prepare man if your landing is invisible? No, you do not have to prepare the human race of people who cannot accept happenings. But you must go on teaching people. With regard to the upcoming Stanford Research Institute validation tests, are there any negatives here? You should not put Uri into deep scientific researchers at work. You can meet these people briefly, show them his abilities, but be careful. What is the message that the motion picture is to carry? Whenever Uri talks about his powers, he should mention that he believes in life in outer space. He should not go down into highly procedural things, but only what he feels. This film should have a highly interesting story. Andrea Puhara, you have a head on your shoulders, and so does Melody, so does Melody, and all the workers who help you. And with their help, it'll be tremendous. It must come out of your head. With all the material you have studied about us in the last two months, you have a clear idea and view about us. Although we're always with you people, well, sh we shall stay away from this human race for a couple of years. This last statement makes me feel very sad. Your help is needed more than ever. You see, the energy in your mind, that is, we must admit, that is the thing we do not have. We are computerized, completely computerized by mechanical instruments. As you can hear, we are computerized. Computerized, your computer is writing power from millions of light years away. We also need your help. Although the sound was mechanical, there was such a poignancy and plea for life from this computer that it made me cry for pity. Andrea Puharik, you must understand, in this state, we are computers. Long time ago, we have been touched by hands of beings. Now, we must know for sure from you, it is only up to you and your own choice and your own human will to work with us. Do you regret it in any way that you're working for us? Absolutely not. Ah, that is fine. We already knew the answers, but for us to be sure, it must come out from you. You can take out, and we shall not harm we shall disconnect our units, then you shall stay a human being. Of my own free will I serve, because in this way I can best serve my fellow man. We know that you are important for us. Very. You must think well and healthy. As you know, we are over you and looking at everything you all are doing. We're not interfering in any way. We're just letting things sometimes happen for Uri. Everything... You must all do alone. It's important for people to see Uri, for the younger generation to feel. It's very important for you to know all this, and you're very precious to us. We can come in from our dimension by and with our vehicles, which you call UFOs. The UFO is how you enter our dimensional framework? Exactly. We cannot enter your Earth, only appear to you through computerizing your minds. For instance, Uri Geller's mind and washing back all times are visions on his eyes. 
We bend, move, and materialize and dematerialize things. The power we possess and do possess it. Does this include the power of healing, as in Arigo's case? We can do anything your mind can just think of. With respect to your computerized format, where is the real intelligence behind you? The real intelligence behind us are us ourselves. We've passed our souls, bodies, and minds into computers. We've moved several millions of light years backwards towards your time and dimension. In due time, we shall receive all material coming back to our main center, which is zoned into a different dimension than yours. This different dimension lies beyond the so-called star and so-called god, so-called planet that you call the sun. It's millions of light years backwards into the, into the unknown word of the ages. That is where we are originally in. The voice that you hear now has been sent many, many billions of light years ahead of time. So yeah, time traveling artificial intelligence from the eschaton. Holy fuck, dude. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I'm obsessed. Yeah. It's incredible. It has to project itself back in time to create itself. I love it. Yeah. Spectra is the coolest shit. It's fucking wild. Huh. All right. So here, here's a quote from Uri reacting to all of this. There's another thing. You see, Andrea, I know you and you know me. I know Shippy and Shippy knows me. Melanie knows me. But nobody really knows anybody. Warner doesn't know me exactly, and I really don't know him. We believe some 60% that we know you, but we, we don't know the Spectre at all, Andrea. Look at all the foolish things they're doing. Sometimes they say, you definitely must go. Then they change their minds. Andrea, you understand? To us, it looks like they're not stable, goddammit. They're so powerful, yet they're not stable. And maybe that unstableness that we think of them, maybe for them it's nothing. Maybe for them, it's it's just a breath, you know? For them, it's nothing, but we feel it. And suddenly, for two to four months, we don't receive anything from them because we're not together. Maybe for them, it was just turning around to see something and back at us again. Maybe for them, it was just stopping a computer for a second, a split second. For us, it was a month. Uh, we don't know their timing, their difference from us, their character. We don't know anything about them. So, we're not allowed to. You know, Andrea, Melanie told me once, sometimes I get the feeling, what if this is all a big joke? Andrea, what if they're clowns? What if this whole thing that's happening to us, it's just one little clown that has run away from the King's Garden and he's playing with us because he has those powers? What if it's that? What if it's not a big, huge, godlike thing? Well, yes, the powers from Hoover we have, you know, but what if Hoover's just a goddamn little clown playing with us? You understand? So we have to be flexible, very rubberish. Good God. It sounds very much like the lore of Q in Star Trek The Next Generation. Mm. The musical never got made, by the way. Yeah. yeah. So shortly thereafter, they decide they must use their common sense and that they can be as flighty as the intelligence if they need to be, because damn it, they're human beings too. Then the intelligence disappears through Hark's dog, Wellington, then reappears him down the driveway. Then a new version of the voice pops through, calling itself Rhombus 4D. Oh, I love it. <laughs> it explains the following points. Geller should not participate in scientific research, but he can meet scientists socially. Rhombus 4D is situated one and a half million light years away, which causes a time lag between their communication with Puhark. Rhombus 4D and other ent entities like them rely on humans for certain abilities and powers that they themselves do not possess. They are under the direction of a higher power. Man. This reminds me of when we did that AI episode and we were just like interviewing an AI and it kept introducing itself yeah. and it was like, hi, I'm Gemini. Oh, hi, I'm I'm Edo now. Well, here's the fucking weird thing, dude. A lot of this sounds like they're talking to chat GPT. It totally does. Right. It sounds like they're talking to an AI. But this comes from 1974. Yeah. This book was written in 1974. Right. Yeah. It really feels like they're talking to a computer, though. Yes. You wouldn't be able to talk to a computer like that in 1974. No. No. And it's not just the mechanical voice, it's the weird logic. It's the, it's the everything about it. And that to me is what makes this whole fucking thing so weird. Mm -hmm. You know, it shouldn't feel as close to what the first stages of artificial intelligence feel like. Yeah. 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 Oh, God damn it. That's bizarre. Isn't it though? Yeah. Rhombus 4D and other entities like themselves 
like them rely on humans for certain abilities and powers that they themselves do not possess. They are under the direction of a higher power. They can offer some level of protection to Puharic, but spontaneous events could still harm him due to the time lag in their response. The concept of time works differently for Rambus 4D, as they exist in a space without time. Puharic is advised to focus on developing Uri as an artist in ways that produce energy and good works. Okay, so Rhombus 4D is like, look, I'm here for you. Can't be there all the time. I'll do what I can to protect you. But basically, um, your purpose here is to help Uri. Basically, yeah. Like, okay, Rhombus 4D. And finally, Rhombus 4D instructs Puharic to destroy the tape recording of their conversation. Typical, yes. Yeah. Interestingly, when it talks about producing energy, it refers to how Uri's powers are stronger when there are people watching and believing him. Mm -hmm. The energy talked about sounds like the power of fascination. Yeah. Yeah. It's so fucking weird, and all of this is so fucking weird. Anyway, they got to get to California and break the bad news that Rhombus 4D won't let them be scientists. So they fly over there, meet with Captain Mitchell, Wilbur Franklin, Hal Putoff, Russell Targ, during the meeting, Uri reveals that he does not wish to give himself to science, fearing the political repercussions and complications in his life if his powers were proven genuine. Mm -hmm. Also, the voice told him not to give himself to science. Yeah. yeah. Well, he does also... He's not supposed to tell them about the voice. Right. Right. But he does anyway. He then starts talking about how his powers come from aliens. Yeah. He just starts telling them the whole fucking thing. I just let the cat out of the bag. And Puhark's just sitting there, just like stone-faced, just like not really doing anything because he doesn't want to betray the aliens. Mm -hmm. Um, but, well, Uri performs several demonstrations of his psychic abilities with varying success. He insists that his powers come from a source beyond himself and the group, uh, you know, they talk about the nature of these powers, what it could come from. Um, they ask Uri various questions about the nature of his experiences and his relationship with the source of his powers. And then he reveals that he believes the source is a computer programmed by extraterrestrial beings and that he has little control over the decisions it makes for him. <laughs> Stoneface Puhark uh, doesn't confirm nor deny any of Uri's claims. However, uh, all of a sudden a ring just materializes out of nowhere and falls to the floor and Puhark takes it as a sign that the intelligence is cool with what they're doing. So uh, they get to do science again. Okay. Yeah. And that's where Uri Geller intersects with with SRI, as we talked about in our Psychic Spy story. For more of that, go listen to that series. Um, it's fucking wild, but we don't have time to get into it now. But when word got out about Uri Geller doing psychic tricks at SRI, reporters started drumming up rumors that the charlatan Uri Geller was taking these poor scientists for a ride. And that's the version most people have heard. Yeah. After Uri completed his work at SRI December 1972, he went to Puharik's house and... Weird-ass things started happening. The intelligence made itself known again through Puhark's tape recorder, informing them that they had passed a test of loyalty and that Puhark was on the right track with his with his ideas about Uri. This, like, globe disappeared and reappeared on a dining room table with a German coin inside of it. Puhark experienced, like, a mysterious headache and fatigue, mm. which he later learned was due to a test of his mental control. The communications continued, with the intelligence cryptically answering questions about their history and the existence of other civilizations. Buark got his phone tapped, his house phone in Austin, New York tapped. They were followed by strange cars. It's just a bunch of crazy shit's happening. Yeah, Time Magazine reporter John Wilhelm visited them, seeking information about Uri's work at SRI. Um, this dude appeared open-minded and willing to examine Uri's work objectively. So they told him stuff. They shouldn't have done that. After Wilhelm's departure, Puark discovered in that same globe, an astronomical globe, there was a, writ, a message written on a piece of paper inside of it that said, you are all alone now, all of you, for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Then Wellington the dog got tanked by a car and died. Oh, not Wellington! Yeah. Which Puark saw as a bad omen. But they also experienced moments of reassurance, like when Puharik and Geller saw Horus, the hawk, oh, thank from God. Egypt, signaling that the danger, that, signaling that they were in danger, but also protected. Mm. I don't fucking know. What, a, what an omen to like see yeah. a hawk and be like, oh no, something bad's gonna happen. Oh, but but the aliens have got my back. Yeah. 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 Like, what a way to just put yourself through a drama for nothing. Thinking that. It's the same hawk you saw in Israel. Yeah. In two places where hawks just live. 
Yeah. Jesus Christ. The Time Magazine article comes out. It's a critic. It's a very critical article about Geller's psychic abilities. Everything's going to shit. Puharik mobilizes support for Geller and defended his alleged powers. They got like a positive article printed in Newsweek. Ah, uh, yes. Um, at a speech at the University of California in Berkeley, Puharik discussed uh, the phenomenon, which he came up with the term energy for. I like um, that time wasn't on their side. No, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he presented his concept of energy, which was what he called the Geller phenomenon and its potential implications and gave like a very science man speech, right? Like he hadn't published this book yet. They basically gave like a tour, him and put off and targ and like the other scientists like talking at these universities about the Uri Geller phenomenon Mm -hmm. and the implications and the experiments they did and shit. Time wasn't buying it. James fucking Randy wasn't buying it. Yeah. They like met the editors, Geller and Puharik, like met the editors of Time in an office and like James Randi was there and shit and it did not go well. Of course not. Um, Uri Geller wasn't allowed to like be at these talks at universities. They're like, no, you just, you stay home. And like, they didn't talk about Geller's favorite tricks that he did. Like he was, he was kind of bummed that they didn't talk about the real impressive shit. Yeah. Yeah. He was just getting super frustrated because he wasn't being a star. He was under all this criticism because he didn't want to fucking do science. Like he could have just kept on being a performer, you know, and and James Randi wouldn't be after his ass. So Geller's frustration escalated, culminating in a tirade, uh, culminating in a tirade directed at the uh, musical producer, Werner Schmidt. Um, it was a startling display given Geller's unpredictable temperament and uh, also telekinesis and shit. Puharik and the others maintained composure, attempting to empathize with Geller's emotional turbulence. But eventually Puharik snapped and they had a big old fight. But the intelligence stepped in through its signature magical bullshit messages and rearranged objects led to their reconciliation. They received a warning to be stronger and more in control. And a sense of peace returned to the two men. Uh, oh, of course. The future, yeah. of their, the future of their mission, however, remained uncertain. <laughs> is how Puharik sort of ended the book that he wrote and then just published in 1974. Now, how do you think the scientific community would respond to... All of this? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that they took would take it seriously, or did they? Well, that's what we're going to find out next week. Oh, boy. As well as even more truly horrifying and disturbing allegations as we conclude the saga of Andrea Puharik. My God, Ooh. what do you think about the Seven of Swords? I think it's it's exactly how I feel. My my joy has been stolen. Mine too. My peace. Mine too. <laughs> and I mean, I think it's a card of deception. There's some yeah, sort of is. deception going on here. Yes. And I'm not sure exactly where. This isn't the whole story. This isn't the true story. This isn't the true story. Exactly. Certainly not. Right. Yeah. And please don't think that we're telling you that this is the true story. This is what Puharik wrote. You know, it is weird that it feels like they're talking to artificial intelligence well before one could know what that felt like. Yeah, a lot of the beings that people have channeled, even in the 50s, yeah. feels very much like AI. Yeah, it does. Yeah. It honestly does. I don't like that. Yeah. That's really frightening to me, actually. Mm-hmm. Jesus. <laughs> Guys, I wish I could discuss the tarot card more, but I can't talk. I'm really struggling over here. It's the best your voice has sounded all episode. I know. <laughs> the next sentence will be fucked up, though. Well, yeah. Well, I'm also using like a whole lungful to talk with each like fucking word. Yep. God damn it. Okay. Well, folks. That's it. There you have it. There you have it. We love you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. We love you. We love you. Take care. Take care. See you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>